Hello, this is Ajahn Brahm, and I wish to welcome everybody to my 70th birthday celebrations at Jana Grove. And this year it's going to be a special celebration. Uh, we're not going to have an arms round on that day. Uh, I'm going to fast. That gives me a chance to enjoy my 71st birthday the year afterwards, because sometimes you eat so much food that it's a danger to my health, especially an old monk like me. And I wish everybody to, if you'd like to come along, instead we're going to have an auction of very nice items to enhance your physical health, your spiritual strength, uh, things like my meditation cushion, things like uh, my robe will be auctioned. This one will be auctioned as well. And have a lot of fun for the day. So those who want to celebrate the birthday, please go online, see that website. And for this year, because I don't want to receive anything for myself, all the donations are going to go for a retreat centre over in Melbourne. That's uh, in the grounds of Newbury Buddhist Monastery, where many of my monks go and spend the wasa and go and help out. And I'm their spiritual advisor, but it makes a very decent donation uh, for all my supporters. It does mean that those donations are some of the greatest merit. The gift of Dhamma exceeds all other gifts. And this is giving people the gift of seeing the Dhamma for themselves by going to a nice retreat center uh, in the, uh, the east coast of uh, Australia. And that's the retreat center at New People Buddhist Monastery. So I wish everybody a very happy time and I hope to see you there on August the 7th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. at, at Muljana Grove Retreat Center over in Perth to make another retreat center over in Melbourne. So all blessings of my birthday to you all and many happy returns to Jana Grove on the 7th of August. Good morning and welcome to Buddhist Society of Victoria Sunday morning Dhamma talk. Due to COVID lockdown restrictions in Victoria, our city centre is closed now until further notice. So today's program is live streamed from Newbury Buddhist Monastery. It will be conducted by Bhante Chunda, who has arrived here from Bodhiana Monastery in Perth for Vasa 2021. Before I hand over to Bhante at NBM, there are a few announcements to make. Monday night meditation program will also be live streamed from Newbury Buddhist Monastery and will be facilitated by Bhante Sunyo, who is here from Perth. The day meditation on the first Saturday of the month, which falls on the 7th of August, is cancelled due to Ajahn Brahm's 70th birthday celebrations. As you saw in the promo video, there are a series of activities organized by the BSWA and BSV to honor Ajahn Brahm on his 70th birthday on the 7th of August. You can all participate by visiting the newly created website ajahnbrahm70th.org. Both BSV and NBA monastics will enter into three months of Vasa, the rains retreat, on 25th of July. I will now hand over to Bhante Chunder from NBM. Uh, thank you, Bhante. Uh, 
Okay, so um, good morning eh? and uh, welcome to another Dharma talk eh? by the Buddhist Society of Victoria and Newbury Buddhist Monastery. Okay, so um, as usual, we start with some chanting. So myself, I like to keep the chanting simple. So we just do Namadasa three times and start with the Metta Sutta. Namo Dasa Bhagavatu Alatu Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Dasa Bhagavatu Alatu Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Dasa Bhagavatu Alatu Sama Sambuddhasa And uh, we will start chanting on the Metta Sutta, one of my favorite sutta. Okay. So the, the Buddha's teaching on loving kindness. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not, not considered, contested and easily satisfied non-burdened with duties and frugal in their ways peaceful and calm and wise and skillful not proud and demanding in nature let them not do the slightest thing that the wise will later reprove wishing in gladness and in safety May all beings be at ease, whatever living beings they may be, whether they are strong or wrong, or meeting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, those those and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let another deceive another, or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or will use with harm upon another, as in as a mother protects with her life. Her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading outwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, free from hatred and ill will. Whether standing, walking, sitting, or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the by abiding, by not holding to wrong views, the pure hearted one, having clarity of vision. Free, free, free for senses eyes is not born again into this world. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Okay, so let me introduce myself, and my name is Bante Chunda, and um, I've been supporting Newbury Buddhist Monastery and VSV for I lost track already but roughly six years so this is my six years back here again and we just got in and arrived just in time before lockdown started so we arrived about just over a week a week and a half ago yes yes so um um so i've been um originally born in malaysia and um i moved to malaysia when i was about roughly 12 years old and um i came across buddhism when I was working up in the mines and got really interested in uh, Buddhist practice uh, and especially meditation. And uh, later on, I um, ordained in um, when I was about 20, 33 uh, in Bodhiyana Monastery. I've been a monk for roughly 12 years. 
I'm a trainee for one and a half years and a novice monk for two years. And this will be my 10th ten, reign, uh, um, beginning of this Vasala. So I will, should have 10 reigns as a fully ordained monastic. So um, yeah, so people can actually start calling me Ajahn, uh, but I'm, all, I'm, I'm pretty easy. Uh. If people call me Bhante or Venerable, I'm happy. Uh. Yes, yes. But Ajahn is just a, um, in, in the Thai, Thai Forest Sangha, Ajahn is usually given to someone that's 10 years in reigns uh, or a teacher. Uh. Yeah. But I'm happy if people just call me Bhante. Uh. I have to keep things simple. Hmm, okay. Um, yeah, so um, so after the Dharma talk, uh, um, yeah, so people are welcome to have any question and answer. Uh, so the Dharma talk would be roughly an hour. Uh, hmm. So today's topic uh, will be good. If I talk about, about the um, yeah, the Buddhist practice as a, as a Buddhist monk, especially I've survived 10 years uh, practicing as a, as a Buddhist monk. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's actually 12 years uh, if I include the two years as a novice. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so practicing as a Buddhist monastic uh, is a bit of a challenge. And um, you see, we don't have a lot of um, monastic in um, Bodhiyana monastery that make it as a um, as an Ajahnna. Um, because the ratio, uh, um, when I first joined the monastery uh, in Bodhiyana, it used to be about um, 10 to 1. So you see about only one monastic to make it to 10 reigns. Uh. But over time, uh, the monastery have grown and we have uh, proper accommodation uh, and things have become more relaxed. Uh. So the ratio now uh, is about maybe 1 to one to 5, yeah, or maybe less than that. Uh. So a lot more people are making uh, making up to 10 years in, in, um, in, in rains. Uh, yeah. The draw rate used to be quite low, uh, 1 to 10, uh, but now it roughly is about 1 to, one to 5. Uh, mm. Yeah, so I may have made it. Uh, um, I've survived being, um, being a monastic for 12 years. Uh, mm -hmm. That's really good. Uh. But I remember in the early days, there's always a lot of challenge. Uh, the challenge of um, coming to um, stay in the monastery as a layperson, um, and see if I can cope with um, being away from my family. Yeah? Um, but it was easier le, because I was away from my family quite a lot le, when I was working up in the mines for about eight years. Uh, I can't remember how long, uh, it was a few years ago, le, about, um, eight years. Uh, so staying up in the mines, flying the fly out, le, it was a bit of a challenge because um, I spent a lot of time by myself. And um, I didn't really want to associate with too many people uh, in, in the workplace uh, um, because they wasn't keeping the five precepts uh, and a lot have a lot of bad habits. Uh, and um, yeah, so um, having a lot of time to practice as a lay person working up the mines uh, was quite um, well, quite um, a good experience. Uh. So I also have that train that um, training, understanding, keeping away from um, from friends and also from families. Uh. Mm -hmm. So uh, later on, I they asked to ordain at Bodhiyana Monastery uh, and Ajapa accepted me to ordain there. So I was ordained when I was about 33 uh, uh, in Bodhiyana Monastery. I did my training there uh, for um, for five years uh, and before coming to Newbury to support this place. Uh. Yep. So um, yeah, so I've been coming back and forward uh, um, every every year uh, since um coming here and support the monastery yeah. Yeah. and also the Buddhist idea of Victoria. So please excuse me yeah, because I got a slight sore throat yeah. and um, I think because I've been working quite a bit out in the weather here and uh, getting used to the cold weather here. Um, yeah, so in the morning, it, sometimes it, the, the temperature can drop down to about four degrees yeah. and it rains quite a, a lot. Yeah. So most of the monks and the um, um, late guests are staying here. Sometimes we are required to do a lot of work, uh, but sometimes it, it rains in the morning and afternoon too. Uh, so um, yeah, so we do do a lot of work outdoor, uh, uh, wearing um, rain jacket and stuff. Uh, but something we cannot manage is just um, this weather, uh, because um, we try and get as much things done as possible before the wasas start. Uh, 
and, and recently we have the storm damage here. So a lot of trees fell down the monastery and quite a, some of the buildings was damaged here. But luckily not, not a lot of damage here. So we did a lot of work outdoor. Here. So I, I think I managed to got myself a slight cold. Here. But my health is really good. I tend to recover very quickly. Here. Anyway, I hope it's not the virus. <laughs> but I, I still have taste. Uh, I, I too, can still smell. Here. So I don't think it's the virus. <laughs> Okay, so going back to um, the monastic practice. Uh, so the Buddhists say, uh, um, these are the three hardest things to do uh, as a monastic. One is leaving the world to enjoy its hunger. Uh, two is um, being happy uh, um, in the monastic life. Uh, and three is keeping the 227 rules uh, and practicing um, the, the Sutta and the Vyanaya. Uh, so these are the three hard, hardest things to do as a monastic. So it is true that for first leaving the monastery was quite, I mean, sorry, leaving lay life was quite difficult. Because um, as a uh, lay person, uh, there was always a lot of contact with my family and friends. Uh, so when I first joined the monastery, uh, that was a big adjustment to be made uh, coming to the monastery. Uh, so I did my first um, two years year and a half uh, training as as a white person dressing in white clothes as an anigarika. So it's it's a phase before you staying in the monastery full time uh, for a year uh, dressed in white, doing cooking, driving and the different work in the monastery. Uh, and so you, you shave your head and just wear white only uh, and you keep the um the eight precept uh, and um, basically not eating uh, and um, the, the fire precept uh, and I'm not wearing um, perfumes um, um, like things like jewelries and, and watches uh, so uh, those are the eight precepts uh, and sleeping on, on a high luxurious bed uh, or chairs uh, sitting on chairs so, I was like, so those, those are the eight precepts uh, when I was practicing as, uh, as a trainee in, in Bodhian Monastery uh, so it's quite difficult uh, when you're practicing it as in as a lay person in the beginning. I think the hardest time I find was um, away from my friends and especially with my family. Yeah? And I stay in the forest quite often uh, because uh, when you, when we, we ordain as a novice monk, uh, um, we stay in the kuti, a small monk's hut. Uh, and usually, usually we spend about maybe mostly up to about 20 hours or 18 hours by myself in the forest uh, in a little kuti uh, and during the wasa uh, maybe we must spend maybe one hour or even half an hour uh, with, with, with the community uh, or the sangha uh. so uh, that's one thing I got it was a bit hard to um, get used to uh, but luckily um, I did have some good meditation as a lay person uh, so that did help me a lot uh. And then as a monastic, uh, so I did tell myself uh, once my med once my meditation uh, improved uh, as a lay person, uh, I'll go and uh, ordain as a monastic straight away. Uh, but I did ask, and my parents say no, uh, um, twice, and um, and I asked again a third time, uh, and they say, look, even if you ask um, three times, uh, the answer is no, uh, while they're still alive. Uh, so I say, well, in that case, uh, I'll go ahead and ordain uh, as a monastic. I'm not going to wait for my parents to pass away. Uh, because who knows, maybe I might pass away before my parents did. Uh. So after the um, third time, uh, I, I went and ordained. Uh. So I waited for 10 years and asked, and my parents say no. And I asked again. And I say, well, can I ordain after another 10 years? And the answer say no. So I said, okay, I'll go ahead and ordain. <laughs> hmm. So uh, leaving the world, so it's also quite difficult. Uh, um, spend a lot of time in the monastery, but after a while you do adjust uh, to the monastic life. Uh, but being hap being happy, happy, happily in the monastic is also something. It's quite a bit of a challenge, uh, because the Buddha say, uh, leaving the world is hard, but being happy uh, as a monastic is also very hard, uh, because when you stay in the monastery, um, it is quite difficult uh, to um, to wear the robe. Um, to live quite simply, have a, a small monk's kuti in the, in the forest, uh, and learning the um, the two hundred and twenty seven precept as a monastic. So it's a, there's a lot of um, um, don't uh, things that you cannot do, and things that you can do. Uh. So that sometimes for um, 
lay people, uh, they might find there's a lot of restriction. Uh, so a lot of lay people don't ordain as a monastic. They find it's too restricted. Uh, so being a monastic, uh, it's almost like being in lockdown uh, for your whole life uh, because uh, there is a lot of things you can't really do. Uh, um, you can't use money. Uh, you can only have one meal a day. Um, so if we work, we have breakfast in the morning, and then we have lunch, uh, then after midday we don't eat anything. But we allow things like cheese and chocolate uh, in the evening uh, just to um, stop the, um, the hunger uh, because we call this medicine for the body. Uh, so tea and coffee is allowable in the evening. Mm. So uh, yeah, with the restriction, it's, it's not easy. And the other restriction we have is um, we're not meant to be alone uh, by ourselves with the op op opposite gender. Uh, so all monastic, we, we're not allowed to be alone with another female um, person uh, in a room. So I think that is a really good rule to, um, to follow uh, because that tends to... Um, um, lessen the defilements of the mind uh, because in some religious um, um, groups uh, um, I'm not going to mention what groups they are uh, but if they don't keep this kind of um, practice uh, then it can lead to a lot of um, um, sexual abuse uh, and in some religion uh, that do happen uh, if the monastic are not careful uh, so um, they tend to lose a lot of faith for the lay people uh, and then people don't um, trust the mon monastic uh, so I'm really glad that the um, that the that um, Lord Buddha saw these defilements that will rise in the monastic uh, in the future. Uh, so they, so he, he did make, make a, a ruler, ruler, a part of the training rules uh, that a monastic should not be alone uh, with another f female by itself. Uh, so no one-on-one -on -one, uh, interaction. Uh, yep. So you see um, uh, the, the harm and the um, disappointment in some of the religion in the world. Uh, but luckily in Buddhism, we kept that rules uh, 2,500 years uh, since the Buddha passed away. Uh, mm. and yeah, so the 220 rules uh, is it leads to the the growth and the fate of the lay people and the um, and the ease uh, and the welfare of the monastic. Uh, and also um, it enhanced the practice uh, because once these rules uh, are practiced by the monastic, uh, it leads to a lot, lot of the happiness uh, of an ease of practice, uh, but also the strength of so strength of samadhi uh, and the wisdom will arise in the future. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this practicing rules is quite important. Uh, and the the third hard, hardest things to, the Buddha say for monastic to do uh, is to keep the twenty seven rules and uh, develop so samadhi uh, and and the wisdom. Uh, yeah, and also to uh, to 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 understand the four noble truths. Uh, and to practice the um, Eightfold Path. Uh, yep. so, um, uh, so being a monastic is quite difficult, uh, and I find uh, um, when you practice, um, I mean, I've been practicing for like 12 years now, uh, being a monastic, uh, and I, I never find it easier. It always gets harder and harder, uh, especially the, more, the longer I stay in Rome. Uh, but as long as the monastery is kept simple and the monastic have time to practice, uh, especially during the Vasa, uh, because during outside the Wasa, we do a lot of work uh, in building, in teaching, uh, and um, basically in um, um, doing service to to our lay supporters. Uh, as I find that I become more and more senior, uh, we the monastic are required to do more service to the um, to the monastery. We require to do more duties, and um, yeah, then time time to practice is less. Uh, because as a junior monk, as a novice and a junior monk, we don't really do, do so, too much work. But after five reigns, we are required to do more responsibility. And after 10 reigns, we have to do more teaching and support the other branch monastery. But I've been coming here for the first um, six years because there was hardly anyone um, coming over. And in Bodhiyana Monastery, there was a lot of work that was required. So, um, yeah, so Ajahn Brahm asked the monks to volunteer to come here to practice. I mean, to practice also to support this place. So, yeah, so that is one of the requirements uh, as a senior monk now uh, to um, just do more service uh, and more practice uh, and more, basically more service and support uh, to the other branch monastery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, practicing this A4 path uh, is very important. Uh, so as a monastic uh, sealer of virtue is very important so the more we practice uh, we practice the higher virtue then um, 
then samadhi is the high mind of meditation then panya or wisdom is the high wisdom that lead to peace bliss and enlightenment yeah yeah i remember the early days as a monastic and the lay person it was quite difficult um Apparently, my first um, Buddhist teacher uh, was an Ajahn Brown. Uh, it was um, um, two groups of uh, Buddhist nuns. Uh, so this group, this group, of these two um, groups of Buddhist nuns. Uh, one was from um, Singapore, and she was my first Buddhist nun teacher uh, when, I was a, when I was a lay person. So I, I took the three refuges uh, and the five precepts uh, um, from her. Uh, so, yeah, so um, just to let the um, people know, uh, my first Buddhist teacher was an Andrew Brown, uh, was a Buddhist nun uh, from Singapore. Uh, so I always have a debt of gratitude uh, um, for the um, for the fully ordained bhikkhunis. Uh, yeah, because they, they did taught me a lot, uh, and they, they taught me to um, to have a happy mind uh, and a pure heart. Uh, and my, my first Buddhist um, teacher uh, um, was a Maya nun. Uh, from Singapore, she taught me that you must develop a loving heart and practice loving kindness. Mm. But also, um, I did look on the internet, and Ajahn Brown was also good at teaching med- uh, loving kindness meditation. So I, I came across Ajahn Brown through the internet and reading books, uh, especially books and also tapes that uh, Ajahn Brown gave. Uh, mm. So sorry for my uh, uh, my my voice. I have a slight sore throat. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, so my Buddhist teacher, she told me that I'm a good person, but I have to be careful who I hang around. So she told me that I must learn to associate with good people. So um, yeah, so that's one thing. One thing she taught taught me is to associate with good people, because that way I learn off their um, um, their good qualities and their behavior, and it also enhance my um, my. Um, my sealer and also um, my, my happiness because up in the minds of associating with um, a lot of people they did not keep um, five, five precepts properly yeah? or drink a lot and just gossip a lot and have a lot of rough speech yeah? so that actually made me quite depressed yeah? but when I become a Buddhist a lay Buddhist um, associating with the um, Buddhist uh, practitioner yeah? and good people it actually helped me to uh, become a happier person yeah? mm. but after practicing as a lay person for years and ordaining in body animal with Ajahn Brown, being a novice monk, um, I did have a lot um, difficulty with the with the sangha there la, because um, there was a lot of men there up, up to about maybe in the community um, up to about twenty men. La. So when you have so many men together, la, and they're all struggling yeah, on the um, being a Buddhist Buddhist um, monk and practicing uh, in a training monastery, uh, there's always a lot of friction. Uh, and it can be it can be quite competitive. Uh, so a lot of monks don't make it. Uh, so a lot of people do this role uh, within uh, from the first to ten years. Uh, so I've seen a lot of monastic this, this role uh, and I lost a lot of friends. Uh, but these days the monastery is a bit more comfortable. Uh, so uh, the dropout rate is less. Uh, um, yeah. So it, being a monastic, it can be very competitive, I noticed, with the Sangha. So I did ask Ajahn Brown, I said, the Sangha is, is, is quite, it's not what I expected. And Ajahn Brown told me that this is a training monastery, so please don't look at other people so much, just take care of your own practice. And that's true, so I have to learn to um, let look at people less and take care of my own practice. But one time we have a Buddhist conference, and I met my um, my my teacher, when I was a lay person, she came to one one of the conferences. There was both of them, and I told her that oh, being a monastic in training as a junior monk is very quite difficult because I asked to do so many duties, and sometimes the um, the middle monks or junior monks will pick on me yeah, and bully me yeah, and just get me to do extra duties and get me to wash a lot of bowls and boss me around the place <laughs> and I told my teacher uh, this is not not what I expected uh, I thought that we have, have a lot of loving kindness uh, and my teacher told me no they say Junda please don't look at other people uh. don't look at other people please don't look at other people look at your own heart uh. 
take care of your own practice, take care of your own mind, and take care of your heart, uh, and uh, develop a lot of good qualities. Uh, and I find that was a very good advice uh, coming from my teacher. Uh, because she's been a, a, a nun for 20 plus years, uh, and I've been helping a lot of um, lay people, uh, and she does give a lot of te teaching. Uh, so I have a lot of really a lot of respect uh, for my two first um, um, Buddhist, fully ordained Buddhist nuns. Uh, so they did really teach me uh, to really take care of my heart uh, and take care of my mind and to always purify the mind and always to always when things go downhill uh, to really don't look at people too much uh, and look at my own practice yep so they, they really taught me to uh, develop your heart uh, and your mind uh. mm. so i think one that's one reason why my meditation improved quite a lot uh. but Sachin Brown really taught me meditation uh, as for um my lay teachers uh, when i was a lay person uh, um these are fully ordained buddhist nuns uh, they uh, they do a lot of service uh, and they teach a lot uh, metal uh, and service and and um, kindness uh. so when i was a lay person uh, my, my um as a lay person my my lay teachers or my buddhist fully ordained nuns they taught me to uh, basically just always be aware um practice meditation uh, uh better a lot of my, um, loving kindness uh, and also um take care of my heart uh, wash my heart very carefully uh, and be a uh, be very mindful uh, to know that the uh, defilements do not rise from one's heart and mind uh, because when we maintain a pure heart uh, then the five precepts is easy to practice uh, because when the um, defilements are strong in one's heart uh, then you see these five precepts can be broken easily uh, so you see the result with the world uh. mm -hmm. yeah so these are was the two really good advice from my my um um my put my Buddhist teacher uh, when I was a lay person, uh, and also when I ordained as a, as a monastic. Mm -hmm. So, looking after one's heart uh, and mind, uh, and knowing oneself, uh, the in internal awareness is very important. Uh, because when you brighten the mind, when the when when there's a lot of dark, darkness in the heart, uh, it's very important. Uh, because when you develop mindfulness, uh, giving the precept uh, and the meditation, you develop the one pointiness of mind uh, that lead to calm and stillness and also the mindfulness becomes stronger so one of the benefits that I find practicing as a as a monastic and a lay person uh, is the practice on loving kindness meditation so this is what the Buddha taught uh, there is 11 benefits uh, in practicing loving kindness meditation so these are the 11 one sleep more comfortably so when you do met loving kindness a lot, you sleep well. Eh? And the second benefit is one, uh, wake up comfortably. Eh? So sometimes I find that if you do have developed a lot of metal, eh? your mind becomes calm and peaceful easily. Eh? And when you wake up, eh? you wake up very calm and peaceful. Eh? And for some practitioners that have met, eh? they practice a lot of loving kindness. They told me when they sleep, their mind naturally go quite peacefully yeah? because when they practice loving kindness a lot eh? through meditation you get the calm and the peace arise eh? and the mind become very radiant eh? and bright eh? so instead of having a, a dark mind eh? the mind is, is, is just brightened up eh? so these are the radiant mind eh? so when they told me when they sleep the mind become radiant and when they wake up early in the morning eh? the mind become quite radiant too eh? so naturally yeah for um, someone that practices a lot of loving kindness, uh, their mind can be very radiant. So sometimes they describe to me uh, that when they sleep, uh, the mind becomes so bright. Uh, it's like a, there's like a light in the mind uh, where they cannot sleep properly. Uh. I say it's okay, just learn to let go uh, and enjoy that. Uh, the mind will let, you know, less, will naturally just just go go into sleep. Uh. But when they describe when they wake up uh, in a dark room, uh, they, they find that like, the mind is quite radiant. Uh, like wherever they look. Uh, it's, it's not darkness, it's brightness. I say, yeah, that's good. So it, it shows well that when you practice a lot of loving kindness, that happens naturally. <laughs> okay. And also, the third benefit is one, do not have evil dreams. So, yeah, it's true. So, persons that practice loving kindness, they don't have bad dreams, they don't have nightmares, they dream of nice things, they dream from nice places. So, yeah, so when that's 
when I stay in the monastery, even myself uh, when I was um, during staying for the having retreats or during the Vasala, sometimes I dreams of flying, um, flying around the place. Uh, so it was quite nice. Uh, you you, feel, you dream you're quite free uh, and very happy. Uh, and dreams are quite interesting uh, as a monastic. Uh, so um, yeah, so you dream of really nice places. Uh, and when I went home to visit my family, um, in in the um, early days as a monastic, when I came back to the monastery, I have really weird dreams. Uh, so one time I dreamed that I went, I was walking with my mom, and one time I saw this person standing up in the tall building, uh, and this young person jumped off uh, from the tr- tr- from the tall building and basically committed suicide. Uh, then I look at the 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 young person that fell down on the building, yeah, basically, it's just, um, yeah, it's just like, almost like a super image. Yeah. Then I wake up like, at night, I go, wow, that was a really weird dream. But when I reflected the dream, what the dream um, taught me was basically going to visit like, my family. Yeah. It was nicer. So time to time, the monastic do visit our family. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the attachment arise in my heart. Like, from my family and, and and remind me a lot of the, the lay life uh, it was quite comfortable uh, especially for um, attachment to my family uh, but also the five senses seeing how comfortable lay life was uh. but after that when going back to the monastery uh, the first few days a lot of strange dreams that come up uh, and that was one of the strange dreams uh, going 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 shopping my mum uh, and seeing someone committing suicide so what that's um, reflected in my mind was seeing that lay life was good la, but it will lead to a lot of suffering yeah, because the mind will get reborn again and again and again and the whole things with the worldly suffering yeah, and the attachment will rise yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah so dreams are quite interesting yeah. yep I'll talk more about dreams later on okay so one is dear to human beings yeah. so when you Practice a loving kindness. You see, people are drawn to a, a kind person, and one is, it's also dear to non-human beings. Uh, that can also um, includes animals, because in Bodhi Animal Street, the monks have been there for so long. Uh, you see, we walk past, uh, and the kangaroos just look at us and just look at us, uh, and sometimes we come over and ask for for food. Uh, but normally, we we not we don't really encourage um, people to feed their can their kangaroos because they can get too aggress- aggressive. Uh, but sometimes in summer, like, and if there's not much grass around, like, sometimes we just give them some small amount of food. Like. Mm. And um, the, um, a person that practices med- loving kind of meditation, especially monastic, is uh, protected by devas. Uh. Yeah, mm, I don't know. That's true. Yeah, maybe. Yes, I think I say in the monastery long enough. There's a lot of interesting things that happen. Yes. So um, you see, I believe that you see the higher beings if there's um good practicing um, um monastic and they practice a lot of loving kindness uh, yeah you see um they are protected uh, by higher beings uh, because i believe that in lay life we get a lot of lay supporters but sometimes when the lay people pass away uh, and they reborn in the higher planes uh, um there yeah, they do continue to support the monastic uh, but sometimes it's quite interesting yeah sometimes when something that's needed in the monastery um, we will think about it and sometimes support will just come up from nowhere la. but sometimes I find it, it's quite interesting being a monastic yeah. sometimes we need something I was thinking about it quite quite a lot la. then a week later la, someone brought something that we needed in the monastery yeah. then I was going that is pretty interesting yeah. I didn't really ask for it la. and later on they arise I go mm, that's quite interesting yeah. but also we have supporters that stay in the monastery yeah, and they say that sometimes if the meditation is doing well and they're walking around, then they notice a really bright light moving around in the in the monastery. And they ask me, ah, oh, Pante, is is the monastery haunted? And I go, hmm, what do you mean by that? I say, describe to me what you see. And they say, sometimes you see a really bright light in the monastery. And they look around, then they look back and they disappear. I go, oh, that's quite normal. But from what I understand from um, Eight people are also monastic when they stay in the monastery during the opposite night. 
uh, the full moon night, yeah, or when um, after a Dharma talk yeah, is given by Ajahn Brown yeah, or any of the monks, yeah, and sometimes lay people report reported to the monastic they see in this really bright light moving around the monastery. Yeah. So I say this is really normal. Yeah. You see um the higher beings will come to the monastery yeah, and to listen to the Dharma talk. Yeah. So these things do happen, yeah, but we, we rarely talk about it. Yeah. And also the seventh benefit is uh, one person that's Practice loving kindness, uh, fire, poison, sword, uh, will not hurt or touch that person. Um, I don't know about fire, poison, uh, or weapons, uh, but all I know is sometimes if someone enter a very deep meditation, uh, especially jhana meditation in the fourth jhana, if there's a bushfire of of a flood, uh, that person actually is protect protected. Uh, and we heard of cases of monks uh, where they um been through um, flooding and they came out of a flooding yeah, and they, they, were, they were fine it's somehow the, there's a force field around that person also a fire like during the Buddhist time they found this monk yeah, that was um, they thought he was dead yeah, so they, they put it onto a uh, a pile of sticks yeah, to cremate the person and they set the fire up yeah, and the next day yeah, um, they saw this monk walking yeah, on Binder Butler so they, they go wow they, they thought it was a ghost, uh, but it's actually a, a person uh, that was still alive. Uh. So, so monks can actually uh, be protected in the meditation uh, if they survive. Uh. Mm. But one thing I do know uh, is um, if you do practice a lot of loving kindness, uh, you see if you get sick, uh, you tend to recover quite rapidly. Uh. So one time I went to India uh, and some of my um, monks and also lay people got a lot of injection for the vaccine. Uh. And uh, when they went to, to um, the pilgrimage in India, uh, oh, I think um, two of the monks that was there like, were sick for like the whole trip. And when they come back, uh, they were even sick for one month. Uh. And I didn't take any vaccine uh, when I went for the India trip. Uh, and I was only sick for one day. Uh. And normally what I find that if I do get sick, uh, I, I tend to recover quite rapidly. Uh. So uh, I, I got this sore throat for the last two days. Uh, but today I think I might recover. Uh. I feel a lot better, but I find that if I talk too much, yeah, then the sore throat gets worse. So I find that as more I talk, yeah, then it gets worse. So I apologize for my um, for my um, not clear voice at the moment. <laughs> and the the eight benefit of loving kind of meditation, one's mind become calm and concentrated quickly. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't use the, I don't like to use the word calm. I like to use the word stillness and peace quickly. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's one benefit that I find. Even I practice been loving kindness meditation. If I get frustrated or irritated or angry, yeah, if I do more metal, then I, f- I find the the meditation become calm and peaceful quite easily. Yeah. and from Lay people and monastic that I know that I practice a lot of loving kindness. Yeah, I see the result with them. They can get meditation, uh, deep meditation quite easily uh, due to loving kindness. Because loving kindness, you learn to develop that emotion of peace, joy, happiness, and also let it go. Uh, because when we calm, when we're happy, uh, we, we bring out those emotion of peace and happiness. Uh, just like what the Metta Sutta has chanted. Uh, we let things go. We let things go goes easily yeah, because we know that as a lay, lay person in lay life it is quite difficult yeah, even with uh, the, the lockdown and people are losing a job yeah, and people are, they do have a lot of fear and anxiety yeah, but same in the monastery yeah, when you have new people training up yeah, as monastic yeah, they are still learning yeah, and uh, when you have a lot of men together like you can compete come become quite con- competitive yeah. But so I, lot, I noticed I'm in the mines was quite competitive. Eh? Then when I went to join the monastery, I feel like the same thing was happening too. Like it can be quite competitive and aggressive. Eh? So when that happened, eh, we must learn to develop a lot of forgiveness and develop loving kindness. Eh? And also one of the be- benefits of loving kindness, it also enhances the meditation. Eh? The mind becomes calm and peaceful eh? quite easily. Eh? But also the the um, ninth benefit eh, is the the person's face becomes quite serene and quite relaxed. So um, so one time I noticed a person that's always angry, their face can become very fierce. But people that practice a lot of loving kindness, lay people in Manasseh, their face become quite serene 
and things like wrinkles uh, and uh, and like wrinkles around the the the, the, the eyes become less. Uh. So one thing I notice uh, if I practice a lot of loving kindness, uh, I I have less wrinkle uh, and my face becomes smoother. Mm, yeah, and the um the tenth benefit of loving kindness meditation when a person passes away or dies or dies. Uh, he does not um, die with fear uh, or worry. Mm. That is quite true too. Uh, because being a monastic, we do go to a lot of people uh, that are dying in hospital or in very old age. And some are old supporters that are dying. Or in um, hospital, I notice when I go and visit them, they tend to be quite relaxed and quite at ease and quite happy. Uh, and they know that getting old, uh, in the 80s or 90s uh, and um, with sickness they tend not to be too concerned or too worried uh, and most of the cases when we come and visit our old supporters they tend to be very happy to see the monastic uh, and they realize that getting older and getting sick and, and, and dying uh, is, is just a, a aging process uh, and and they realize through dharma practice uh, as they get older and this body fall apart uh, it's, just, it's just nature uh, and we, we will die and we will get reborn again and again. So taking care of the mind and the welfare of the mind is very important. That's why we, as a Buddhist practitioner, we put a lot of effort to um, develop the higher mind and purify the mind. That they lead to a deep meditation. And we know this body will fall apart. We have to let go of this body sooner or later. So we've through the deep meditation, we let go of these five senses and we drop this body as much as possible because um, as we get older there will be more pain and more sickness in this body so if we can learn to let this body go early please do so let it go don't carry this body around because it is quite a big burden as we get older and as, as I know that um, I get this sore throat and if I go into meditation I can actually drop it and manage to heal and recover then if I if I don't drop the body then I find that the, the irritation will get worse but if I do drop and rest more then it can tends to heal a lot faster <laughs> yeah and uh, the lamb benefit is yeah if, if the person don't develop their practice deeper and penetrate into the Four Noble Truth uh, that person may get reborn in the Brahma worlds uh, so uh, yeah, so these are the um, eleven benefit uh, of loving kindness meditation. Uh. So these are these eleven benefit eleven benefits of loving kindness meditation. I find was very very practical uh, and quite benefit beneficial uh, in monastic life. Uh, because I know the Sajjan Bra also practice a lot of loving kindness, uh, and he says sometimes if the meditation is not working, it's just when you apply a lot of, a bit of loving kindness, uh, then the meditation will come deeper. Uh, yep. And I find that with a lot of monastic and lay people too, those that practice loving kindness, uh, they tend to have very good meditation uh, and tends to um, do well with it as a monastic life. Uh, because sometimes if people don't make it through in monastic life, uh, they, you see there are some cause and conditions. One is if the meditation is not doing well, two is they're not happy in monastic life. Uh, and the third reason, uh, it does happen once in a while, uh, is, is the practitioner start um, having um, um, less so desires for the opposite gender. Uh, yeah, and you see it with monastic in all the tradition. Uh, and that when that happened, uh, some abusive behavior do happen. Uh, but sometimes some of the senior monks uh, um, that we know before, uh, um, they've been enrolled for like 20, 30, 40, even 40 years. And they, they tend to fall into that trap. Uh, and this role and go off with some, some other person and get married. Uh. So, uh, yeah. So, Ajahn Brown is not the first abbot of Bodhinyana Monastery. The first abbot of Bodhinyana Monastery was Ajahn Jagaro. Uh, and later on, he, he did this role uh, and uh, went off with one of the supporters uh, and married her. Uh. So, yeah. So, that things do, monastic do fall into those traps. Uh. So, that's why for most monastic, uh, we try not to stay with the of the gender uh, alone too much uh, especially late, late, late our late female supporters uh, because sometimes as a, a senior monk uh, when you um, become more senior uh, 
you tend to uh, do more teaching and you more have more uh, interaction uh, with our female supporters uh. and sometimes it can be very sweet uh, and sometimes some of the um, junior monks or even the senior monks can fall into that trap uh. mm. yeah so also one thing uh, as a monastic I notice uh, um, is becoming more um, apparent uh, is the eight whirling early winds uh, eight condition uh, of um, happiness and suffering fame and be no uh, be nobody uh, praise and blame uh, gain and loss uh. so this um, apparently become more um, apparent uh, being a monastic uh. yeah these eight willings we need to blow a, a lay person or monastic around uh. and if we're not careful uh, we can fall into this 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 eight willing condition hmm it's quite interesting yeah but the simile is quite um the Buddha did keep a simile yeah, of the eight willing winds. It's like a tree. Yeah. If the tree is not grounded in in practice, in um, in sila, in some sambal- in samadhi and wisdom, uh, these eight willing winds will blow a person around uh, and topple that person. Because um, I mean, in the last less than a month ago, uh, we did have very strong wind uh, in, in Victoria. Uh, and a lot of the trees did collapse in us in uh, Victoria like, in, in the state forest. So when I came back to the monastery, I went walk walk around, uh, and I noticed a lot of the really big trees that uh, have basically toppled over, uh, and um and collapsed in in the monastery. But until I noticed that uh, a lot of the smaller trees have collapsed uh, compared to the really large trees. Uh, the really large trees, uh, some of the branches have um, broken off uh, and fell down. Uh, and uh, in the central area, lucky some fell down, uh, but did not damage the uh, the buildings. Uh. And luckily, it happened at night, yeah. So there's no one walking around the monastery uh, when the trees and the branches came off. Uh. So the same thing what the Buddha say was, um, if if we're not grounded deeply in our uh, in our, in our practice in sila and samadhi, uh, then this eight really condition will blow the person down quite easily. Uh. So when this condition grows, we must really um, deepen our, our, develop our higher virtue, our um, samadhi, um, mindfulness and stillness of mind, and our seal, our panyala, wisdom. We know these eight willing conditions always come and blow us around. So happiness, we all like happiness. And sometimes when things happen, when it's good, well, we enjoy it. We, we know it won't last, this too will pass. And when suffering arises, well, well, lockdown happens, um, we lose support, a uh, lot of supporters will come, our donation drop, then we go into debt, la, or uh, we can't pay our bills. La. Okay, great. La. Well, when lockdown happens, great, we have a quiet monastery. Um, no, especially last year during the lockdown, it was great. La. Um, we did have a lot of um, free time to practice, and the monastery was very quiet. Uh, but well, a bit of suffering, uh, because we didn't have so much donation come in. Okay, great. We don't we don't so, we don't spend so much money. Uh, we can really cut down on our expenses and live very simply in the monastery. <laughs> so we basically just cut down on everything uh, as much as possible. Um, also, one the um, the condition is fame and uh, be nobody. Uh, well, I think when I become a uh, a um, monastic uh, and as a trainee, uh, I was basically just a nobody. Uh, it's great, uh. <laughs> but as I came and support this place more and more, uh, then um, yeah, I get you get a bit of fame. Uh, oh, it's good to be um, um, in charge of this project in the beginning, uh, but later on I realized that oh, if someone can do a better job, that uh, better if they do it. Uh. And uh, as more and more senior months came, uh, it's better if they take more respons- re- responsibility. Uh. But as for well myself, uh, I always find that it's always good to share duties and responsibility out. Uh, because in order to build a community, uh, it's always good to share things out. Uh. So um, yeah, so fame and be nobody, uh, um, it don't really concern me. Uh, because I find that sometimes when you, you get fame, uh, it, it comes a lot of responsibility. Uh, and if you're not, not being nobody, it's even better. Uh, so you f- become free. You don't have to worry too much and you live a simple life. And um, also one of the conditions is uh, praise 
and blame. Well, I, I do admit that uh, I get to, I do get praised a lot uh, for things that I, I may never have done. Uh, I go, mm, I don't, I, I get praised for things that I've never done. Uh, but also the, the interesting thing is I get blamed for things I, have, I never have done too, uh, or things I have done. Uh, so this praise and blame uh, does arise quite often uh, as a monastic and also as a lay person. Uh, so when then things come, uh, praise or blame, uh, we reflect on it, but we don't carry it in the heart. We let it go. We, we don't get concerned too much. Yeah. And also the last con the, the last um, condition is gain and loss. So this is quite common. We get gain a lot, and we and we lose things a lot too. Yeah. So uh, when we gain, well, it's good. We when we gain, when we know it's not going to last too. Then we when we lose things, we know that it's, it's normal. Yeah. These are the this is life. Uh, this is we born as a human a human being. Uh, this eight willing condition will happen uh, quite frequently. Uh, mm. But when it do happen a lot, uh, one thing the Buddha did give us a lot of simile uh, on on this condition. Uh, so the, the Buddha did say uh, always reflect on this condition. Uh, so he gave the simile of the lotus. The lotus uh, is a flower that grows in mud. Uh, when the condition is right, the lotus will grow from the mud and it will bloom and it will be beautiful and yeah, beautiful flower. So this condition is a lotus can only grow in mud, dirty water where it's, it's just pretty disgusting. <laughs> so when when this eight condition arises, when we get blown around with suffering, we can go, we find refuge in our, in our seal in our samadhi uh, and in our wisdom uh, we go inwards into uh, one's heart uh, in, uh, into one's mind uh, and we develop wisdom uh, and we develop sila of um, the higher virtue uh, and we develop um, the mind uh, the higher mind and samadhi then that leads to wisdom uh, and understanding so these are the um, the wisdom uh, that must develop uh, as a monastic, so we become an island to ourselves. So when we come be an island to ourselves, we spend a lot of time by ourselves, especially meditation. We go internal. Yep, that leads to um, happiness and freedom. The mind that is attached from the, the eight worldly condition and through our senses. Yep, but also this is also another simile yeah, that I, I, I read in the in, in the internet yeah, because um. Only when the um, darkest night, yeah, it produces the brightest stars. Uh. So sometimes in New Brave Buddhist Monastery, yeah, when the, when there's no full moon, when, when there's no cloud, uh, I look up in the sky, yeah, then I see the, bright, the brightest stars uh, and the most beautiful stars uh, when everything is dark. Uh. So yeah, so when, there's, when the storm come, when the rain come, uh, things will roll. Uh. Because we are storm, we are rain, plants will not grow. Yep. So always look for the rainbow. Uh, yeah. When there's when there's storm, and when there is um strong winds, and and strong wind and rain, then yeah things will grow and become strength strength strengthen. Anyway, I think maybe I'll, I'll, I'll stop now because I think my voice is getting worse if I talk too much. Okay. So I'd like to um, open the any questions, question and answer, please. Thank you, Bande, for the wonderful talk. We have received seven questions so far. Mm -hmm. So would you like to select or answer them or how do would you prefer? Uh, okay, I think we'll just go by one, by one by one and see how much time we have. Sure, thank you very much. The first question, how does one use fear as a practice such as having the fear of seizures? Seizures, okay, seizures. Hmm. Okay, seizures. I haven't looked into seizures too much, uh, but sometimes it is a... Um, genetic um, condition and some people are born with this genetic condition so 
one hour senior monks, uh, his mom's got um, a seizure. T- time to time, uh, it will happen. Uh, and um, she, when she goes out shopping and stuff, uh, her husband will always be very close by her. Uh, and she will sometimes wear a, a helmet. Uh, so when she has a seizure, uh, an epileptic seizure, uh, um, her husband will basically support him, support her, uh, and make sure that she won't fall down and, and smack her head on 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 the table or on the floor or yeah, on the cupboard yep. so um yeah so one of our senior monks his dad just passed away last year so he can't make it to join us at, at, at Newbury Monastery so now at the moment he's taking care of his mum so he did went and stay with his mum for like a few months uh, taking care of things uh, and getting things sorted out uh, um, getting the wheels sorted out uh. so I think the most important thing he can do is just being kind to his mum. But for a Buddhist practitioner, we find that we what we recommend to our supporters, just be kind. Be kind to the sickness. Make peace with the sickness. Because when we make peace with the sickness, regardless if it's a seizure, a sickness or a cancer, then um, things do improve a bit. Because what I think we find that the meditation class in the next to the hospital in Perth. Uh, those patients that come in to do the uh, meditation class, uh, if they do the class, uh, they, they tend to cope well with the sickness. Uh, and if they do pass away, uh, they pass away quite peacefully. Uh, but in uh, many cases, uh, those who have the sickness or the cancer, uh, they do learn to live with it. Uh. In many cases, we have people that have cancer. Uh, they're not meant to be alive. Uh, and they actually meant... Uh, Manage to live a few more years longer, and some actually live uh, still alive. So we do know of a lay supporter. There's um, a good supporter of Dhammasara Monastery. Um, she he was diagnosed with uh, cancer uh, all over the body, uh, and he was not meant to uh, uh, live long. Uh, but that was since ten years ago, uh, and he's still alive. Uh, so if we make peace with the sickness, uh, and make peace with ourselves, uh, then we can learn to cope with the condition. Uh. Yeah. Because when we make peace with everything, our body becomes quite strong. I hope that that's a good, good, good um, um, answer. Thank you, Bande. The next question, can you reflect a bit on the Namo Tassa and explain it? Thank you from Florida. Okay, Namo Tassa. Okay. <clears throat> so I can leave it, read it in English. So what it means in Namatsasa three times is homage to the best of one, the worldly one, the the we'll say the fu- the right one or the fully fully enlightened one. So basically we reflect on um paying respect to to the Lord Buddha um because he's um practiced well and um fully enlightened and one is worldly of respect Honor and um, um, I can't remember another word um, of of respect and, uh, and and support yeah uh, there is because my um, my Pali is not that good but I think Ajahn Bamali did did um, um, explain about it um, maybe you can ask um, Bhante Sunyola next time he give a talk because he is a is is a Pali expert and uh, he does study the suttas quite quite in, in detail, uh, so it might it, it might give more more meaning to it. Uh, yeah, but what it means in English uh, is homage to homage to him, the blessed one uh, and the worldly one uh, and the the one that's fully enlightened. Uh, okay. Thank you, Bande. The next question is: over indulgence in addictive food drinks like coffee or tea breaking the fifth precept if they affect your mental and physical well-being um mm, i think with um food is fine because um <clears throat> with food like you should see how much food we get in uh, bodhiyana monastery during the weekend now uh, we get up to about maybe 100 di- di- dishes and some of the food is incredible. Like I told my mom, I haven't eaten so well before as a, as a lay person compared to as a, as a monastic. 
I mean, some of the food we have in Bodinan Monastery is incredible. Even in lockdown, uh, we have delivery service uh, and the food is still uh, quite really incredible. Like we get different dishes from all over the world. Uh, like I mean, all, like the, all different dishes from people, um, different style of dishes from all over the world. Uh, that people cook uh, Japanese, Thai, Sri Lankan, Western, Italian, um, yeah. And sometimes we get steaks, sometimes we get lobsters, um, sometimes we get uh, durians. I like durians, so sometimes it's nice to have it. We get fast food, we get burgers. And um, the monks really eat well. Uh, and I mean, as a lay person, uh, I really enjoy food. Uh, as a monastic, I really enjoy food too. Uh, and a lot of the senior monks also enjoy, enjoy food. Uh, and um, uh, it's fine, it, it never really affected my meditation. Um, if I overeat, uh, and I find that if I, I might get a bit um, too sleepy uh, in the afternoon uh, to, um, to, to, to calm the mind down. Uh. So, yeah, so if you do enjoy food, it's fine. Uh. For monastic, it's not, it's not a, a big problem uh, because uh, we have maybe one meal a day. Um, I, no, I normally eat one meal a day, but if work, I have breakfast. Uh, so I need the ex extra energy. Uh. So I, I find it's not a problem uh, enjoying food. Uh. Because for monastic, uh, we don't eat after 12 o'clock uh, or midday. Uh, and um, I know a lot of the senior monks uh, and monks myself uh, really enjoy food. Uh, but it's not a problem. Uh. So whatever they people offer, uh, we're just happy to take it. Uh. And as long as we don't go out demanding for, for food, uh, it's okay. Yes. And the fifth precept uh, with um, drugs and alcohol. Uh, um, with drugs, best to do. To avoid it uh, and keep away from it uh, because I've seen a lot of harm uh, with friends that are not Buddhists uh, just indulging too much with uh, legal drugs uh, because it does do a lot of harm but if there's benefit taking um, medical um, chemit um, medical um, chemit um, drugs uh, like chemitis uh, what, what, what they call um, uh, the description marijuana drugs, uh, so that is fine because that, that's basically described for people that have cancer or very sick. Uh, because there is a lot of benefit uh, for people that that take um med medical did de de um, describe uh, chemical chemicals uh, because sometimes when people are in a lot of pain, so they they need to get marijuana. Uh, or what they call the slang word is, is ganja, uh, that's described by the doc doctors. And that is fine, uh, because sometimes when you take those things like that, that's described by the doctors, there's a lot of benef benefit from it. Uh. So uh, anything you do that with, with medicine-wise, uh, should, that should be fine. Uh, and that should be up to the, the doctors and the individual uh, to, um, to seek for advice from the doctors. For the... For the monastic, uh, we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't recommend it, people taking drugs, uh, except for if it's a medicine uh, described from the doctor. Uh. Mm. Yep. So that's, that's the uh, Buddha, uh, Buddhist point of view uh, on, um, on, on, on the fifth precept. Uh. In terms of alcohol, uh, best not to take it, uh, because when you take a little bit of alcohol, uh, it, it can always lead to more and more. Uh, and when you look at um, a lot of problems uh, in the world, uh, um, fights, arguments, uh, and accidents, uh, it's, it always sometimes most of it leads to um, just, just taking too many, drinking too much. Thank you, Vande. The next question. Did you get angry with your parents when, they, when you find out that they did not intend you to allow to ordain? Um, I mean, I, I did got a little, a little bit annoyed but I, I think I was glad, glad that, that, that they stopped me from um, ordaining uh, because at that time I was pretty naive. Uh, I mean, I was getting good meditation. I thought I would ordain and um, really go for it uh, and um, <clears throat> get the result of the fruits uh, and meditation quickly. Yeah. But now I realize ordaining as a monastic, that was really stupid thinking. <laughs> Um, because uh, as a lay person, uh, I really struggled five years uh, trying to get result in the, in my meditation practice. Uh, because I practice, um, I met, to cut the story short, uh, um, 
I start reading too much too much books and asking too much question for, from too many monks. The more I ask, the more the harder I try, the more doubts that arise in my practice, and the more I really suffer. Into the point I got I got a headache. Instead of doing samadhi, I was doing getting trying to gain something in, in my in my practice in my in my meditation practice. It's only after five years I decide to basically let it go. And I give up practicing meditation. Then I basically just relax and let go. Then I find the meditation start to do very well. And I was getting good, good meditation after five years as a lay person. I go, ah, uh-huh, uh-huh, this is really good. So I say, okay, I wait for five years and I ask my parents if I can ordain. So that was good, a good learning experience. Because um, when you're young, you're always very eager to ordain and practice. Luckily, my parents would say no, so I, I continue to practice as a lay person. But sometimes I find that a lot of monks are ordained quite young in Rome. They haven't um, experienced a lot in life. And sometimes the sad thing is a lot of them ordain are this role quite early in life, like within five or ten years. So having a bit more life experience as, as after ten years, it did help me a lot, become more, more mature and a bit more relaxed. And also I able to um, basically help to um, pay off my pay off my um, my parents' debt and pay off the house. Thank you. Thank you. The next question. I'm new to this teaching and would like your view on if a person constantly argues with everything you say, how do you stop feeling so hurt? Can living, practicing, demonstrating kindness be perceived by some as weakness, and um, why? It's always good. This is this is always a hard thing. Yeah? Even even myself, I, I find it pretty difficult as a lay person at work. But basically, once I become a supervisor, then it was easier. That I was in charge of the workshop. Um, but also, I I do have to argue with with the customers too. So sometimes I tell the customer, look, I only try my best, but if they don't like the, the work or the service or the bill, please feel free to go somewhere else. <laughs> um, but sometimes it's funny, sometimes they go somewhere else and they come back later and say that I do revive, revive a good service when I was working as a mechanic and also running my business as a lay person. So being a, um, a Buddhist practitioner, um, you, you tend to be more very trustful that we work. Uh. So we we try not to uh, boast too much with work uh, and say we try our best. Uh. Yep. So um, so I was quite a um, I wasn't the best mechanic. Uh. I I did things quite fairly uh, and with with um respect and kindness uh, to our customers, and because of that, like uh, we we earned a lot of trust uh, trust from our, our customers. Uh. But as a monastic, when I ordained. Uh, um, in the Sangha, especially living with 20 to 30 men, it, it can be quite con- competitive. So when you have uh, that many men in the, in the, in the Sangha, uh, monks and lay people, uh, it, it can, it, monks and lay people, we can rust, start rubbing against one another. Uh, so it's really great for the practice. Uh. So sometimes a lot of the, the, the Sangha members, uh, especially the young ones, uh, they have a lot of this testosterone uh, and they have to um, vent it out uh, in, in work or in argument, uh, argument state sake. Uh. So as a practicing um, monk now, uh, sometimes for me, I just, oh, if they want to work hard, go for it. If they want to take a lot of project, go for it. If they want to always win an argument, okay, that's a business. I just keep quiet and just walk away. Because that, what I find that there's always a lot of um, nice Buddhist practitioner, lay or monastic. You see, I, I always remember what my, my teacher told me, yeah? associate with, with, with the wise and, and the good. So I always choose to hang around with good, kind uh, Buddhist monks yeah? that have good practice. Yeah? So that can be with Ajahn Brown um, and my, my other Buddhist friends. Uh, and those that want to, uh, very, very competitive, they always argue a lot. Uh, 
it's basically I just keep away from them. If they want to win, they win. Because even if you're Dana, people are still human beings. Yes. So it's a hard one. I do have difficulty, but these days I just learn to let go and let people be. <laughs> and just live a peaceful life. Okay. Thank you. The next question, how do you become kind even though you don't feel kind? Ah, oh, okay. Okay. If you do do it, please do it for yourself. Yep. That's why Ajahn Chah once said, yeah, you should look at other people uh, 5% of the time. You look at yourself 95% uh, of your time. Ajahn Chah once said, he gave a simile. One time he went into the forest. It was quite peaceful uh, and he was getting good meditation. And when he went out from the forest and went for peanut butter, went to the city, uh, he heard a lot of noise. And the lay people was just basically making lay noise and um, yeah, playing loud music and stuff. Uh. And he got really annoyed and upset uh, of, of the noise. Uh. Then he reflected on the noise and said, oh, is the noise disturbing him? He said, no, he's disturbing the noise. Uh. So um, yeah, so he says, his mind, he reflected not to, um, disturb the noise. So basically not to allow the noise to disturb your heart and your mind. So even if you feel angry or upset or irritated, um, sometimes we, we just have to um, go into peace and, and calmness. Like for myself, if sometimes if if there's too many arguments uh, with, um, with lay, lay people uh, or monastic, uh, then sometimes the matter might not work. One day I, in the monastery is funny. Yeah. Um, four people, four monastic uh, argue, pick up, pick up, start picking on me for no reason. Uh, one monk say that, oh, if you come over, uh, don't just be nice to me and give me drinks and stuff. Uh, just leave me alone. I go, oh, okay, no worries. <laughs> I just walk away uh, from that person. Then another monk came up to me and said, oh, so you changed the talk, the type of your talk. You didn't like my talk. I said, well, um, yeah, I just decided to change the talk because um, I feel like the talk is, the type of the talk is not, it's not, it's not proper. And as I decided to change the title of the talk better. So that, that monastics are arguing with me. Then, um, yeah, then, then I got another phone call uh, from another, another monastic uh, saying that the uh, Brass Monastery. Uh, then he would start arguing me about all the problems that's happening in the monastery. Uh, and, the, and the tractor was broken down. Uh, and I did a, uh, a, 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 excuse my language, a shit job on the, on the tractor. Uh, I was going, oh man, this monastic, uh, he, 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 he drives so roughly. Uh, with the monastery vehicle, like when things break down, he he come and blame me for the for the for the problem the vehicle. Ah, oh, jeez. Ah, oh, yep, yeah. So, is is quite difficult. Yep. Sometimes on that day, yeah, I think four different monks start picking on me, and arguing with me, and sometimes if I carry it in my heart, then it is quite a bit hard to have a peaceful state of mind. Sometimes best thing we do is we just practice love, um, letting go meditation. If we, if we can't practice loving kindness, we practice, we practice letting go meditation. We let, we let things go and we make peace with ourselves. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And the last question. Uh, this person said, Dear Bande, nice to see you in NBM. Thank you. Can you please explain a bit how to drop the body during meditation? Thank you. Oh, okay. 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 The, the dropping body is quite important. It's also something I practice in the beginning. Um, that's why when you listen to my um, guided meditation, um, I do not go straight into the, the breath straight away. I always do a body scanning first. So when you do a body scanning, you learn to relax the, the part of your body. So you start from your head, we relax your, body, your head, we make peace with it. We start with our upper body, our arms, our tummy, to our legs, and back all the way up again. So when we do a body scanning, 
we learn to relax his body, then we learn to um, make peace with the pain, with the ache of the body, then we let it go. And then once the body becomes very relaxed, uh, then we go to our breath meditation. So we go to our breath meditation, as the body becomes relaxed and calm, then as the mind becomes more calm and peaceful, uh, then as our thoughts become less, then as, as the mind becomes more calm and relaxed, uh, then the body becomes more relaxed and more calm. And once that happens, uh, in some cases, uh, when the body is not moving, uh, then the, the body will slowly fade away and disappear. So when the mind becomes very relaxed and peaceful, uh, then, then, you will, then you sometimes you notice, hey, where's the body? I can't feel the body. I can't feel my back. I can't feel my leg. I can't feel my, my arms. It's like the body disappear and went to sleep. It's only when you bring awareness to the part of your body, then you feel the body sensation arise but if you relax uh, and calm the mind uh, then it will disappear uh. so that's how you learn to let go of the body uh. mm. yes that's all the questions okay thank you um no if there's no more questions um i did during the dharma talk i did say i'll go back to the um the dreaming the dreaming uh, the dreaming state as a monastic the dreaming is quite interesting. As a monastic, the more you practice meditation, what will happen is meditation will become a natural part. It becomes automatic. Then um, mindfulness will also become natural as samadhi deepen. So it becomes act, um, um, a almost automatic process. Meditation, mindfulness, and letting go. And when that happens, um, meditation uh, will slowly go into um, in, into into the dream state. Uh. So uh, I've met a lot of um, monks and lay people uh, that told me that when they uh, did a lot of meditation and when the meditation was doing well, uh, they have very interesting dreams too. Uh. So things like flying is quite normal, uh, but also they, they start dreaming about meditation. Uh. <clears throat> so Ashim Brown always say that sometimes when I give a Dharma talk. Uh, he, he, he start dreaming about meditation uh, and in his dream too. Uh, so that's also quite interesting. Uh, yeah. And uh, sometimes, uh, even myself, uh, when I was doing a lot of meditation, I start dreaming about meditation uh, too. Uh, so I was like, dreaming that I was, I was meditating in my dreams. Uh, so that was quite interesting. Uh, it was a very nice meditation too. Um, but also, one of the monks uh, in the monastery uh, that I know, uh, he was saying that um, he, when he was dreaming, he was dreaming that he was um, in his dream, he was up in the mountain, walking up to the mountain, uh, somewhere maybe in Asia. Uh, he saw, he walking up to a, a monastery up the mountain and he went up to a, a Dhamma hall and he went to the Dhamma hall uh, and he saw a Buddha, Buddha statue, Buddha Rupa, like something like this. And he saw the Buddha, Buddha statue of Buddha Rupa, there was a ray of, of light coming from it, uh, bright light, bright white and blue light. Uh, it was going, wow, the Buddha Rupa is just got a ray of light coming out from it. Uh, then he, he noticed from his, within his, his neck uh, that he was wearing a, a, an amulet of a Buddha Rupa uh, and there's bright, pure, pure, bright, white, radiant light coming from the, from the Buddha Rupa. Uh, the amulet in his, in his, is wearing his neck. So he picked up the amulet uh, and look at this um, white, radiant, bright light. Yeah. So more he looked at it, uh, he was drawn into the bright, pure white light. Yeah. And suddenly he, he woke up uh, from his dream uh, and his, 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 he woke up with, with his mind uh, completely bright, radiant, uh, pure, uh, joy, happy, happy, calm mind. And that was basically the the meditation went from from um, from meditation when he, even when he was dreaming, he was dreaming of, of, of radiant bright light. So he woke up with a lot of happiness, peace, and calm. So yeah, so just one thing, one one thing I heard from one of the monastic uh, in Boniyana Monastery. Yeah. So we do have rules uh, on that monastic. Yeah, so we don't mention. Uh, we just mention what he experienced. Uh. Yeah, so yeah, so if you do 
practice a lot of loving kindness, and so you see the result will happen. You, you just the meditation would will, will naturally becomes natural part of, of dreaming state, and that normally happened. Um, yeah, when you on on a two weeks meditation silent retreat or during the wassail. So when I came here, I was hoping oh mm, there might be a lockdown, so we we can we, I can go for a quarantine. But we just arrived before lockdown happened, so we, we then went on quarantine. Okay. Okay, thank you, Le. Thank you for attending this Dharma talk. So um, tomorrow, Monday night yeah, at 7.30, Bhante Sunyola will be conducting the garden meditation. Okay, so thank you for uh, attending this Dharma class. And Bhante Chunda, would you like to talk about the Ajahn Brahm's 70th birthday? <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, so it's, um, the details is online. So I haven't looked through the detail yet like, because I was preparing to come through here. Like. So um, Ajahn Brown will be celebrating his birthday, um, 70, 70 birthday party in Janago Retreat Center. Like. So there will be, um, I think there'll be a documentary on Ajahn Brown's life. Like. And also Ajahn Brown is, is raising funds like, um, for the Newbury Buddhist Monastery project like, in um, in in up, up in the monastery yeah. so um yeah so I should hopefully he, he raise funds so be, raise funds for his birthday party yeah. and to, be, to build a monastery to build a retreat center here yeah. basically for the benefit and happiness for the monks for the nuns especially for the lay people yeah. because the lay people don't have a place especially in Victoria yeah. so if we do manage to do get a re retreat center builder yeah, then the four four community will be fully established. So the monks will have their own place where they can stay and practice. Um, now basically with, with, with their own group. And it will be, be very nice for the nuns to have their own place uh, where only the nuns to stay and practice. And all the lay people uh, will, will have, have their own uh, lay center uh, where they can stay and practice. Uh. Um, in, in their own group because the set up in um, Bodhiyana Monastery is nicer we have the monks monastery then Dhammasari have the nuns monastery and the lay people have their own retreat center like, where they can stay and manage and practice like. so the monastic the, the monks and nuns will come over to the lay center like, on this build like, have their arms rounds then go back to the, their own um, monastery to um, to eat and, and, and also to practice and have a quiet time. Because when that happens, it will enhance the the precept, the meditation and the wisdom of all, all monastic. Because when you have monastic monks and nuns and lay people making mixing together, it, it tends not to um um it's not the best support for um for, for the Sangha. But you have monks, nuns and lay people have their own place, then the monks and nuns and the lay people uh, will, will benefit a lot uh, because especially the monks, uh, we'll, we, can, we can keep our precept well and, um, and the lay people basically have their own place. Uh, so we can be monks as monks and nuns can be nuns as nuns. Uh, and the lay people have their own place uh, where they can basically uh, manage their place uh, and also practice well. Uh. So it will be very exciting uh, in the next two years uh, once the lay centre is built. Uh. But um, I don't know all the detail. Please look, look online to, to, to find more these detail. Yes, it's Arjun Brown seven seven zero t h dot o l g. Yes, yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So um, have a good evening. No, good afternoon. Good evening and good day. Please be careful. And uh, stay, 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 stay at home with families. The more we can mix. Mix and uh, mix and mingle with other people outside. Yeah, the more we can safe safeguard ourselves. Uh, because when you keep the five precept and when you stay at home, uh, you basically protecting yourself and protect, protecting other people. Okay, thank you. So we have. I'm a sangha.